This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha and welcome to Hawaii's Living Legend Lawyers, presented by the Hawaii State Bar Association and Think Tech Hawaii. I'm David Farmer, your host. Our guest today is a member of the prestigious three-digit bar number club. This year, he celebrates his golden anniversary as a Hawaii licensed attorney. Melvin Mel Masuda was born and raised on Maui's Puanani Plantation, went on to earn degrees from Princeton, Yale, and Harvard. His law career has been described as that of a maverick and a Renaissance man. <coughs> Instead of <coughs> returning home and building a lifetime career with a Honolulu firm, Mel spent eight years in solo practice, three years in public service, and three decades as a professor of law. His proudest achievement, in his own words, is outside of the law, raising two now adult children. Son Maka, an Iolani grad, is a big data expert for in-house counsel at Microsoft headquarters in Redmond, Washington. Daughter Kaeva is a Kamehameha School grad with master's degree uh, in <clears throat> the area of counseling and is the career, college and career placement counselor at Wailua High School. Today we're going to meet Mel and find out what makes, uh, him, made him become a maverick and how he looks back on his adventures in the law and, and what also made him become a professor. Uh, more specifically, how rewarding for him is that role than the alternative paths his credentials may have allowed. Welcome to the show, M Mel. You're quite welcome. David, thank now let you. me uh, let me just start out. Uh, we uh, mentioned your uh, uh, proudest achievement. Yes, um, sir. How would you, uh, if you were uh, asked, how would you rank your life priorities? Well, that uh, that would be uh, fairly um, um, straightforward. Uh, it would be family, and I am a person of faith, so family and God, uh, followed by, of course. Uh, uh, my work in the law, uh, which has, uh, as you've noted, <laughs> followed a different path than uh, you know most private practitioners. Indeed, the um, your 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 roots uh, go back to Maui to Puanani Plantation, and your dad was a, a, a immigrant from Fukushima. Uh, tell us a little bit more about. Uh, yes, um, um, as. Um, <clears throat> History shows uh, back in 1924, um, the U.S. Congress passed uh, Anti-Japanese uh, and Other Asians um, Act. Uh, it was called the Japanese and All Other Asians. And uh, you pointed out to me from your research, also Arabs Exclusion right. Act. Back then. <laughs> back then. And uh, my dad uh, made it into, onto U.S. soil uh, just before the gate closed um, in 1920. Uh, and he emigrated from uh, that area uh, nor uh, in northeast Japan. And I often think, you know, if he had not emigrated, uh, unfortunately, I would probably have been one of the victims of that horrible tsunami in 2011 in that exact same area. And in fact, his hometown of Namie, which we visited when I worked in Japan uh, earlier, um, uh, is now unfortunately unoccupiable yeah. because it was contaminated by the uh, the destruction of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant, electrical plant. Yeah, it's a very sad situation. Um, as you um, had a, a fairly brief, considering your total career period where you were in, uh, as a solo practitioner, um, what, are, what kind of cases did you handle? What's your most uh, memorable case? Like uh, most solo practitioners, you pretty much, uh, we were uh, joking off camera about that earlier, <laughs> you pretty much uh, take whatever you can get. Um, and um, actually, uh, this harkens back to my mentor, um, whom we'll speak about later, Chief Justice Richardson, because he also was a solo practitioner before he, um, you know, ventured into uh, public life, that sort of thing. But uh, my most memorable case, uh, involved uh, <clears throat> a previous generation running back from Dallas named Calvin Hill and his wife Janet. Uh, they were friends from Yale. Uh, and what happened uh, in the mid-70s is that uh, 
there was a franchise formed out here for a four-league uh, World Football League. See, Seth Till. Uh, actually, it was Chris Hemeter. I'm uh, sorry, Chris yeah, Hemeter. Hotel I know why I said Cease Hill. <laughs> yeah, uh, anyway, so uh, Chris managed to entice Calvin away for big bucks, <laughs> away from the Dallas Cowboys. And so uh, they came um, and um, they settled and rented a place out on Kahului Street in Kalama Valley in Hawaii Kai. And they had a, fi a very tall five year old named Grant, <laughs> whom, as you know, uh, became Grant Hill, a uh, star for Duke uh, NCAA championship team, and also, of course, for the NBA. But what happened was that Calvin spent all summer working out, and then Janet did a reverse commute. She had a master's in math from the University of Chicago. So she did a reverse commute all the way from Hawaii Kai to Leeward Community College. Um, and uh, uh, what happened was that I didn't go to the first game of the season, and <laughs> I get this phone call uh, in the evening, and it's a frantic Janet saying, Mel, you have to help us out. We don't know any other attorneys here. What's happened is that Calvin broke his ankle in this first game, and <clears throat> what's going to happen is that the Bank of Honolulu and the franchise, uh, Bank of Honolulu had issued a guarantee to both me and Calvin, and, uh, you know, and the franchise, they are refusing to pay us anything. You've got to sue them. And I thought to myself, my God, if I sue them, the investors are all the big partners in the big lo local law firms here, and my name will be mud. And I told her that. But she, you know, uh, she persisted. And unfortunately, a little bit of too much of aloha on my part <laughs> to these uh, newcomers who needed help. So I took the case, and we got them a good settlement. And my friends, uh, my attorney friends who advi advised me not to take the case were correct. Mm -hmm. The next thing I know, um, the Hills have uh, returned to the U.S. mainland, I'm, and I'm left out here. <laughs> <laughs> but that was very interesting, to say the least. We did get them a very good settlement. Yeah. Well, and also, <clears throat> the, um, uh, your philosophy of law practice, uh, that we talked about this a little bit before, but what, please share your, what you uh, feel is the, uh, what motivates you in terms of your practice of law. Well, there's that uh, famous old uh, French term, uh, chacun a son goût, which means to each person according to her or his own taste. And so, uh, it, you know, everything, to me, everything in the law is good. Uh, whatever one's choice uh, as an attorney in the law is fine. Uh, in, in my case, what, I, uh, what attracted me to the law, because I had no role model, my dad was a waiter uh, at Halikulani, and my mom was a uh, pineapple trimmer, you know, taking the tops off the pineapples at Dole Cannery. And so I had absolutely no role model, and um, what um, uh, I had in mind really was that I wanted to go to law school and use my law degree eventually, whether it was private practice or any other area of the law, like teaching, to help other people. And I was able to do that in two very distinct ways. When I was in law school, my best summer job was actually uh, as a federal agent going through the South, um, Louisiana, Georgia, South Carolina, <coughs> um, verifying compliance uh, for uh, black-white racial integration in preschool Head Start projects. It could have been a dangerous assignment, could uh, it? It actually, you know, when you're younger, you don't really think about that. I'm sure that my parents were horrified and worried. But, you know, you don't really, uh, when you're young, you don't yeah. really think you're about that quite <laughs> exactly, quite so much. Um, but, um, yes, I did notice that I got dirty looks a lot of times. And as my boss back in D.C. said before I went on my uh, field trips to do my uh, compliance verification, uh, he said, quote, when you walk in the door, uh, looking like you do, meaning Asian, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they'll know they're in trouble. <laughs> anyway, so that was one area where, you know, I, I got a good glimpse of being able to use the law to help. And then the other area was after I had spent, um, um, the reason for my maverick career, as we'll discuss later, is that I had spent about seven years away. But when I came home to settle down, um, I did um, <clears throat> run into, I used to hang out at, <laughs> the old gold coin 
restaurant at the corner of Kapiolani and I King Street. I remember that. And um, uh, the entertainer there was a fellow named George Helm. Yes. And he was uh, from Molokai. And he found out I was an attorney. So <laughs> the next thing I know, George is saying to me, uh, can you help us out for free? <laughs> <laughs> pro bono. <laughs> you know, pro bono manuahi. Um, uh, we're coming up with a protest group to protest the fact that ancient trails on Molokai were closed off by the Molokai Ranch. So why don't you come over and, you know, we'll introduce you and then, you know, you can help us. So this was before Kaho'olawe This initiative. was, yeah, a year before the mm -hmm. Kaho'olawe initiative. And mm -hmm. so what happened was I went over and, um, uh, as you know, um, Molokai is 6,000 people, virtually all part Hawaiian. Right. And uh, when I walked into the room, uh, I got horribly dirty looks. And George whispers to me, he says, oh, they think you're this Japanese investor from Tokyo <laughs> who's here to buy their land, <laughs> you know. And I said, oh, and I gulped. But, uh, you know, uh, once they got to know me, and, you know, yeah. it's like everything else, once you get to know the person and you look beyond the outside characteristics. Right. And then uh, the next year, uh, George formed the Protect Kaola the Ohana. Mm -hmm. And so I assisted him. And then, unfortunately, when he disappeared uh, and presumably drowned between uh, Kaholawe and coming back to Maui in uh, uh, March 1977, it was really through tears that I uh, did the album, uh, wrote the album liner notes for his posthumous album. And then several years later, what happened was that the vinyl album was reissued as a CD, and um, <coughs> um, Harry Sorea from Territorial Airwaves on the radio. Mm -hmm. um, uh, he took my liner notes, they're public domain, sure. and then he <laughs> put some introduction on it, and he got the hoku for it. <laughs> <laughs> so, at least I know it's decent writing. Anyway, yeah. Well, as a former journalist, you were, uh, as a young man going through, uh, even <clears throat> before college, you were working for the advertiser, yes, were you not? Yes, I was a uh, full-time reporter for the uh, now defunct <laughs> advertiser, <laughs> which, merged. <laughs> yeah, which exists as the uh, caboose end of uh, Honolulu Star Advertiser. Um, and, and also, too, we've known each other for many years mm -hmm. as fellow board members on the publications committee that does the Hawaii Bar Journal. That's correct. And yeah, so both as an editor, journal. as a writer, you've continued your journalistic uh, endeavors, correct? That's correct, yeah. I've always thought that uh, journalism is a great preparation for any lawyer uh, because it, think, you, it causes you to think in very succinct terms of what, when, where, why, and how, you know, mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. uh, those are, those are, are Oh, good I skills. agree totally. Um, um, uh, some people, and, and many lawyers do not like writing, mm -hmm. and uh, when in my classes, uh, when I um, uh, comment on writing assignments and research assignments, I, uh, <coughs> my dictum is, just keep it short, right. <laughs> keep the sentences short, right. and mostly declarative sentences. You're not writing for the Nobel, Peace, uh, Nobel Literature Prize. Right, so, right. Well, and then yeah. also, too, I think the observation's mm -hmm. been made, good writing reflects good thinking. And mm -hmm. the fact mm -hmm. is, if you can't write well, you're probably not thinking well either. Well, many attorneys who hate writing, of course, would, would, would disagree. disagree with it. <laughs> that's, a, that's a free country so far, anyway, that we can talk about. All they have to remember is, Short sentences, you know, and um, uh, just short declarative sentences. That's really all yes. you have to remember. Yeah. We're going to take a little break, and we'll be right back. Okay. Thank you. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. You can be the greatest. You can be the best. You can be the king. Come banging on your chest. You can beat the world. You can beat the war. You can talk to God. Go banging on his. Aloha, my name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea comes on every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join us. I like to bring in guests that talk about all types of things that come across the sea to Hawaii. Not just law, love, people, ideas, 
history. Please join us for Law Across the Sea. Aloha. Welcome back. And uh, we are continuing our conversation with Mel Masuda, uh, that uh, is our guest today. Uh, uh, Mel, you had, uh, uh, I had mentioned in my introduction, and you had discussed uh, briefly the, uh, the appellation of being a maverick. Uh, <laughs> do you want to expand a little bit more on why uh, or how it came to be that you became known as a maverick? Oh, I love those big words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's an Appal <laughs> appellation, not appellation, <laughs> uh, meaning the, uh, the nickname yes. of being a maverick. Yes. Uh, how that came to be was that um, um, uh, I got out of law school during the Battle of Vietnam War. And I had to join the Army Reserves, did my basic training, did my six months, um, you know, uh, full-time active duty. And then I came home. I had already luckily... Uh, uh, been chosen as a law clerk to my mentor, namely Chief Justice Richardson. So in the middle of that year, what happened was that um, I had applied for a program called the White House Fellows Program. It's a nonpartisan, very high level, so to speak, uh, program which selects 15 people nationally every year. Um, and um, we, uh, if you're lucky enough to be chosen among the 15 from 2,000 applicants, um, then you uh, uh, get to serve for one year as a staff assistant to White House staff members or to a cabinet secretary. So um, it did appear uh, in the middle of my clerkship year that I was going to probably get the White House fellowship, which I did. I was the first from Hawaii. So I went to my mentor, C.J. Richardson, and I said, what should I do? And he sat back <laughs> in his comfy chair and he chuckled and he said, well, uh, let me tell you this, you're going to be a maverick if you stay away from Hawaii too long. Because if you stay away from Hawaii for five years or more, by the time you get back, all of the people who started in the profession, uh, you know, with private firms downtown are all going to be partners and they won't want to let you in. <laughs> right. So uh, let me put that on the table right away for you so that you understand that. So I said, hmm. <laughs> but I went through and I did uh, get the White House Fellowship and I served as uh, a staff assistant to the uh, then uh, Secretary of the Treasury, uh, who was uh, uh, David Kennedy. Now this was the first, what I call the first Nixon administration. Yes. Before, unfortunately, Humpty Dumpty had a great fall <laughs> in his second administration and ruined it for right. us all. Right. Uh, uh, as I've mentioned to you before, you know, this interview, um, uh, I took that as a sign from the gods that I was not meant for full-time <laughs> public service. <laughs> but uh, uh, the point that uh, the CJ made actually came true, which mm -hmm. was that um, uh, after I, or during my last year at the White, uh, with the White, during my last few months with the White House Fellowship, uh, we had a field trip visit to Boston, went to the Harvard Kennedy School, and the Dean of the Nations, Harry Weiner, there said to me, uh, well, you've done Princeton and Yale. Um, uh, Make it a perfect like, three. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what, how'd you like to do an ice hockey, what they call an ice hockey hat trick, yeah. and make it a perfect three and come to Harvard, right. and I'll let you into the Harvard Kennedy School. So uh, that's how I spent, uh, you know, uh, two years at the Harvard Kennedy School, got a master's. My classmate was uh, current Senator Jack Reed uh, from Rhode Island, mm -hmm. who is the, uh, up for his uh, fourth term this November. And he's the ranking member of the uh, Senate Armed Services Committee. Mm -hmm. And he's also on the Senate Intelligence Committee, which is investigating, of course, the current the, regime, the, the <laughs> Russia situation. Yes, yes, yes. Anyway, but um, after that, then uh, having done the Ivy League circuit and all of that, I thought to myself, uh, you know, I spent all this time proving that I'm a, uh, you know, I'm a good American and I know absolutely nothing about my Japanese roots. Right, right. <laughs> so I went to, uh, I was fortunate to uh, get a two-year law clerkship uh, in Japan with the international business law firm of Anderson, Mori, and Rabinowitz in Tokyo. Mm -hmm. And in Japan, uh, you cannot practice law as an attorney if you're a foreigner. Right. Uh, you know, you have to go to a Japanese law school. So that's why I was a law clerk. But it was all very interesting work. And then you know, I came home. But by then, the CJ was correct. 
which is that I was a maverick because I was off the normal career path. Right. Um, yeah. Well, also your your gig in uh, Japan allowed you to visit the ancestral home. Uh, oh yes, yes. We went to uh, with my uh, mom and dad who are uh, alive. Then uh, we went to my dad's uh, what they call in Japanese Furusato, his hometown, mm -hmm. and. Um, uh, it was uh, fascinating because uh, I found out two things. One was uh, his cousin said to me through an interpreter, you know, your dad was really kawaii-so because, meaning um, we had to take pity on him right. because he was left behind at age three. His parents couldn't take him to Maui <laughs> and, and they didn't send for him for 10 years later. So every morning he would go out to the beach, look in the direction of Hawaii and say, when are my parents coming home, oh, no. which of course they never did. Right. And the second thing is they promised him uh, an education when he arrived. And uh, when he arrived, he was sent, because the child labor laws weren't strictly enforced, he was sent to work in the cane fields. Right away. <laughs> and right away. Right. And so one day his friend Hirai uh, didn't show up for work uh, five years later. And so he said, where is Hirai-san? And they told him, oh, he's got, you know, he lucked out. He got this cushy job as the dining room waiter at the Plantation Hotel. So he went to his friend Hirai, he tells me, and he says, I told Hirai-san, oh, next job, please, Shimpa, you know, please beg for me <laughs> to have the next opening, right. which he got. And then, of course, when the hotel uh, dining room, um, you know, had to close because the plantation was closing, uh, he then had to move to... Uh, uh, to Honolulu, and he got a job at Halekulani. But sort of like, you know, his parents had to leave him behind, he had to actually leave us behind on Maui mm -hmm. while he came to look for a job. Well, know. and as you and I shared, mm -hmm. uh, the fact uh, I, I started my young life as a, a waiter in New York City, but I think that any lawyer, if they haven't had some life experience before law mm -hmm. school, mm -hmm. uh, should have a year's uh, internship at Pick Your Favorite Restaurant <laughs> and uh, uh, to learn customer service mm -hmm. and what the real world is about because unfortunately our profession is woefully inadequate when it comes to customer service. But that's another... No, uh, no, I would, I, would, I would agree with that yeah. and that's one of the points that I do make in my, um, in my courses. I teach both criminal justice and business law and um, the way that the transition occurred was that um, uh, uh, what happened was essentially uh, that my kids came along. Mm. My kids were born, and my wife said, uh, you want a wife? You want kids around? <laughs> yeah, you're going to have to stay home a little <laughs> you're more. You're going to have to stay home a little more. <laughs> yeah. So what the, uh, what the academic schedule allowed me to do was to actually have flexible hours so mm. I could actually take the kids to school, you know, Iolani Kamehameha, mm -hmm. and then I could pick them up. And uh, uh, that proved to be really quite uh, uh, wonderful in terms of bonding and also in terms of support. Mm -hmm. um, the big family crisis we had was uh, 22 years ago when my son was 15, and uh, at the end of his sophomore year at Iolani, uh, they did an x ray because his hand was hurting. And believe it or not, they actually found a case of cancer of the wrist. Wow. And on the internet, we researched that. There were only three in the whole wide world that year. Um, so, you know, he did have to have, uh, luckily they were able to save, save uh, most of the forearm, although, you know, he has about maybe two thirds of it. Mm. And they also, uh, uh, Dr. Singer at Queens also did a marvelous job. He saved the dexterity in uh. his right hand, uh. you know, so, um, but I was there. Mm -hmm. The main point is I was there and I was available because I had the kind of flexible schedule um, that the academic life uh, allowed. Right. So um, uh, that was very important to me. Um, and as I said, family and God are most important. So, right. you know, right. that worked out quite well. Well, do you think that um, having pursued uh, the uh, non-practice uh, path, mm -hmm. uh, that your credentials uh, gave you the opportunity of both, uh, how would you, uh, how, how, how would you describe the rewards in the, in the work you've done that you continue to do as a professor, emeritus now, mm -hmm. uh, as compared to the, at least the little taste you had of solo practice? Mm -hmm. how, how do those rewards compare? Well, actually, I would say, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, it's all good. Yeah. You know, uh, when I discuss um, options in the law 
to my students who are juniors, seniors, and MBAs, um, I point out that uh, what a law degree does is that it gives you the training and background to move in all kinds of different directions. There, there's a somewhat of an old saw on that that says it's too bad that legal education is wasted on lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> but that's another, uh, <laughs> another look at the same uh, yeah, thing. Yeah, that's true. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I, I would say, um, you know, um, it's like the uh, Sinatra song, My Way. Yeah. It happens to be okay for me, but, you know, it would not be satisfactory, have been satisfactory for um, other individuals. You know? Well, and also, too, I think you found the satisfaction that you talked about in private practice of helping people solve problems, of helping them with their problems. In a sense, that's what you do with students all the time as oh, well. Oh, yes, that's correct, yeah. Um, your earliest education, well, not very earliest, but certainly a, one of the stepping stones in your education was at Roosevelt High School. That's correct. Uh, and you were in the English Standard uh, program, system or, uh, program. Uh, for those people who are not familiar with it, uh, maybe describe it, but also say uh, how much do you credit your future a afterwards uh, education at Princeton, Yale, and Harvard, not too shabby any one of those, <laughs> much less all three, uh, with your success subsequently? Well, um, <clears throat> uh, Professor Christine Yano, uh, who is a sociology professor at UH, um, she's, uh, I, I jokingly call her the world's expert on Hello Kitty, huh. because she does have a published book on how, on, uh, how Hello Kitty traveled you know, across the Pacific. Which became, is an amazing story. And yes. it became a worldwide phenomenon. But she is now working on the manuscript about the so-called um, capital E English, capital uh, S standard, capital S system mm -hmm. in, in the Hawaii public education system from 1924 uh, you know, for four more decades. Mm -hmm. And um, what, um, uh, what she points out is that it was actually separate but equal and it was actually allowed for by law. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. And then it was finally phased out, of course, because after World War II, it was viewed as discriminatory. Right. So they phased it out. But what it was was to get into the system where you had some elementary feeder schools that fed into Stevenson, into, uh, now, now middle school, and Roosevelt High School, uh, was that you had to sp pass a spoken English test. Right. And if you were shown a picture of a cat and you said uh, at age five in perfect English, that's a cat, but you said yeah. in pigeon, yeah. that one cat, yeah. <laughs> you yeah. flunked the test and you didn't get into English standard. Yeah. You know, so I was lucky because I was able to transfer from Maui into the English standard system here. My mom actually went down uh, to Stevenson and begged the principal for a district exception, uh, which I got, you oh. know. And then it turned out that uh, the CJ and I bonded very well because, <laughs> because he himself is a graduate of the Roosevelt High School English Standard System. Uh, Mel, I, I have to tell you, this would, we could continue on for another hour and a half or two or three hours because it's a fascinating story you have to tell. Unfortunately, we are out of our time here, and uh, I think this is actually your second time at Think Tank Hawaii with this series. Uh, you would, three, four years ago, you were with... Um, several years se ago. Several years ago. Mm -hmm. So, but anyway, it's been a pleasure to talk with you, and uh, I hope our viewers also have enjoyed it. And uh, thanks, thanks for appearing on Think Tank, and I uh, uh, hope to do it again. Well, you're quite welcome, and thank you very much.